Okay, so the here we go. So the uh, notebooks for this exercise is in the MapMiner repository. So if everybody goes in, oh, the MapMiner folder, sorry. So if everybody goes into that folder and opens the unit one notes, there's a blank version and there's a filled version. I'm going to type along. Feel free to type along or just um, you can. There's going to be exercises where you get to practice the things that I've taught. So if you just want to listen, that's also fine as well. So let me make this visible. How's the font size? Does that look okay? Good. Okay, so this is a tutorial on using the tools that we've developed at the Materials Project to do materials data science. So that's in a buzzword, uh, machine learning. So in this uh, exercise, we're going to do three things. We're going to show you how to download data sets. We're going to show you how to generate machine learnable descriptors, which I'll introduce in a little bit more detail later on. And lastly, I'm going to show you how to train and evaluate a machine learning model. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with machine learning and the general process, it typically looks like this. So you start off with a data set. So this is um, your raw input, uh, for example, a composition uh, here or a formula. Uh, and your target property. So this is the thing that you're trying to predict. So this might be the band gap or the total energy or something like that. And the aim is to train a machine learning model where you put in your composition, where you feed it in a composition, and it tells you what the band gap should be of that material. Unfortunately, machine learning models can't really understand kind of abstract concepts such as just a composition or a formula. And so instead what we have to do is firstly we have to convert this formula into something that the machine learning algorithm can actually understand. And the format of this is what's called a feature vector or a descriptor vector. So actually throughout these lessons you'll probably hear me use the words descriptor and feature kind of interchangeably. They're effectively the same thing. Uh, and these vectors are just lists of numbers. Uh, and then what we do is we train the machine learning algorithm to, based on this list of numbers, be able to predict what the target property should be. So if you're starting out in machine learning, there's generally a number of questions, three questions which you might ask. The first is, how do we actually get this data? Uh, where can we get this data from that we can train on? I think you'll have seen a little bit of this yesterday where you used the Materials Project API. Um, the next question is, how can we convert these raw inputs, like a formula, into these machine learnable vectors which I've been discussing? And lastly, the kind of final thing is how do we actually then take our features and our outputs and actually train a machine learning model on it? And so we've developed this code called MapMiner, which has kind of been designed to integrate all three of these problems. So it integrates with common materials databases, uh, so you can retrieve data. We have tools for extracting features from compositions and structures. And lastly, we integrate with um, the kind of machine learning packages which implement uh, machine learning algorithms. So these are things like scikit-learn uh, for conventional machine learning and Keras for neural network or deep learning. So kind of the, the deep learning stuff is beyond the scope of this workshop, but there's tutorials online if you want to get into this a little bit more. We're going to be kind of dealing with this scikit-learn, which I'll come to in the last exercise. So as I've already mentioned, uh, the kind of first part of this process is to get our data set. Um, so how can we do this? Well, uh, MapMiner interfaces with these, uh, with some materials project databases. So these are things like the materials project. Um, and then we also have other databases like Citrine, uh, which is a commercial one. We have Aflow uh, and some other ones like this. And so you can use these, you can get data from them in a similar way that you would just from the typical uh, materials API. Um, MapMiner also includes a series of data sets which come from published literature. So these are papers where somebody's published a new machine learning model and they've tried their model on a set of data. We then provide you that data so that you can test your own machine learning models on it. So these data sets are generally better curated, um, they're filtered so they include kind of realistic, pro um, realistic materials uh, and they're just very good in general if you want to quickly trial out a new machine learning model. And so I would add this right now, we have a whole separate repository built just to give you examples of how to use the MapMiner code. So there's a link here to this MapMiner examples repository. I'd seriously, if you want more information on this, you can check it out afterwards. There's, uh, it goes into so much more detail than I can get into here. So 
I'm not going to touch on how we get data from these materials APIs, and instead I'm just going to show you quickly how we can get access to the published data sets. So MapMiner includes this function which is called get available data sets. And all you have to do to see which ones are available is if we just run this, it will just print. Oh. Huh. So this is uh, because I'm not in the right virtual environment. So just give me one second. God damn it. Try this again. Okay, let's try. Does this work now? Yes, okay. So let's run this get available data sets. And all this will do is just print out. So here is the data set name. So this one's called Boltstrap MP. And underneath is a description of what the data set contains. So this is generally how many entries there are and what the source of these entries are. So for example, are they calculated, are they experimental, uh, what sort of functional was used if they are um, calculated. So if we want to download one of these data sets and use it, we just take the name. So here I'm going to choose the dielectric constant uh, data set and this contains 1056 structures with dielectric properties. Uh, and then, so if we come down past this long list of available data sets, uh, we can easily load a data set using this load data set function. And so all we do is we load it. So I'm going to assign it to a variable called df, and we're going to load this data set just simply using load data set. And then this data set name is a string, so we just put it in quotation marks. <coughs> and if we do this, this will download it. So for me, it didn't give up any kind of message here, but for you guys, it might have come up with something like loading this data set from some specific URL. And that's because when you download MapMiner, it doesn't actually include all the data sets in the repository itself. And this is just because uh, in kind of putting all of these data sets within the repository would make it very big and very cumbersome to download. So actually, when you, f when you request a data set for the first time, it downloads it from the internet and just stores it locally on your computer. Uh, if you uh, try and load it again and it's already been downloaded, it will load much quicker. So here you can see we've uh, assigned this to a. We, we, you can see we've assigned it to this DF object. Uh, all MapMiner data sets da are downloaded as uh, data frame objects or pandas data frame objects. Mm -hmm. So these uh, pandas data frame object is a type of spreadsheet. So you can think of it in that way. It contains rows, it contains columns, uh, and the columns have. Column, indices, uh, column kind of titles. So we can see just a quick summary of the first few rows and columns of a data set by using the, DF, uh, the head function, which all different data frames have. So if we type df.head, and we get this very nice um, summary of the data set, you can see here that we have columns for materials project ID, formula. Um, you can kind of scroll across and see more of the columns that exist in there. So sometimes if a data set is very large or if there's lots of columns, you won't actually be able to see all the columns or all the rows, and instead it will just be abbreviated with a kind of a dot, dot, dot. So you can see all the columns available in a data set just by typing, uh, accessing the columns attributes. So if you just type df.columns, oh, sorry, I misspelled that, columns, then it will just give you a, a list of the columns that are present. Okay, and another really useful function of pandas data frames is the describe function. So if we run this, this will give a, a summary of all the numerical columns in a data set. So if we run uh, the dear describe function, you can see that, for example, uh, it tells us if we look at the end sites column, it tells you the number of entries in it, the number of rows, and it gives you the mean, standard deviation, min, and max values for that uh, column. And so this is where pandas is, pandas is really useful because often in machine learning studies, you'll get a data set and you need to kind of, before you do any machine learning on it, you need to check that your data set contains uh, data in, in a kind of valid range. So you've got to check that your data itself is worthy of machine learning. 
Um, and so what you want to do is check for things like outliers or uh, NAN values and things like that. And the descri this describe function makes it really easy to do this. So this, this data set has already been filtered, but let's use an example. If we take this um, polyelectronic column, which is uh, the electronic dielectric constant, if we look at the min and max values shown here, you can see that they range between 1 and 256. And so we know just by looking at those columns that these are in a kind of reasonable range for a dielectric constant, and therefore we know that our data is probably quite clean. So this is a really useful method um, and kind of really gives you a good overview. What happens if we want to kind of dig down a little bit into more details about our data? Well, we can index a data frame and kind of get a specific column using uh, the same indexing scheme that you use for dictionaries. So let's say we wanted to get um, uh, access a particular column. For example, the, let's say we wanted to get the, num the band gap column here. We can just type df band gap like that. And this will give a what's called a pandas series op, uh, object of this is the row number and this is the band gap associated with that row. We can similarly index, so that was indexing a specific column. We can also index a specific row and see what data we have for a row. And we do this using the iloc attribute. So similarly, we type df.iloc and we can give it a specific row number here. So for example, if we give it row 100, this gives us all the data associated with that specific row. So again, this is just very similar to uh, kind of how you would access, like you can think of this in a very similar way as to Excel spreadsheets. This is gonna get annoying. Um, so, okay, so we've got our data set, we've checked that the values seem reasonable. What happens if we want to kind of create a subset of it? Let's say we've got our data set of dielectric constants and we actually only want to consider materials which are non-metallic, so those which have a band gap of greater than zero. Well, we can do this using Pandas data frames really easily. So we can kind of filter data frames using standard Python comparison operators. Um, so the first thing we have to do to do this is we create what's called a Boolean mask. So I'll show you what I mean here. So let's take our um, band gap column, like we did before. And let's say we only want uh, band gaps which are greater than zero, so metallic, we can, we can do this. So this effectively gives us a list of true and false values. It's true if a row satisfies this condition, and it's false if the row doesn't satisfy this condition. And so we can get the entries associated with this just by assigning this to any variable, I've called it mask here, and then we can index the data frame using that mask. So if we do this, then we get back a data frame object where only the entries where the Boolean mask equals true are included. So you can see here, if we go to the band gap column, you'll now find no band gaps greater than zero. Oh, sorry, no band gaps which are less than or equal to zero. Okay, so that's how to filter data frames. That's one way of cleaning them. Often we might want to do something more drastic and just drop whole columns from our data set. Um, so often some columns aren't really necessary for machine learning. And so we can do that um, by, oh, so I've, I've actually just done exactly the band gap one here. So we'll skip onto the next cell. So what we can do is we can drop data, data columns by using the data frame drop function. And this is effectively just going to remove a, a column from a data set. So we can do this by assigning uh, a new data frame called cleaned data frame. And we're going to drop the following columns. We're going to drop n site, space group, e electronic, and e total. So all we need to do this is just give a list of these column names. And e total. And the last thing that we need to do is tell it whether we're going to drop rows or columns. So this is obviously very obvious to me and you that we're dropping columns here because these are named, but you can also have named rows as well. And so uh, we can specify whether it's a row or column using the axis option. So if axis is zero, then that's a row, and if axis is one, then that's a column. So if we run this, and then uh, we've assigned our kind of filtered data frame into this cleaned DF function, and we can see that if we 
inspect it using the oops, inspect it using the head function. Now we don't have the end site space group uh, and these other columns which we've just removed. Okay, so this is how we clean our data set. What happens, so we've shown how to kind of remove columns. What happens if we want to add columns? So this is another quite a common thing that you might want to do. In this data set that I've just got above, it has uh, columns for the electronic contribution to the dielectric constant and the total contribution to the dielectric constant. So the dielectric constant is actually composed of two parts. It's composed of um, the electronic contribution and an ionic contribution. So let's say we wanted to actually add a new column to our data set which contained just the ionic contribution. How would we do that? Well, we can do this really, really easily in, in Pandas. Um, we can just do that simply by assigning uh, data to a new column. So for example, to do this in this case, let's make a new column called polyionic, which is going to contain the ionic contribution to the dielectric constant. And you can see here the formula is the total, so we call it poly total minus the electronic contribution, so it's um, and if we do that and then inspect our data frame, you can see that if we scroll all the way to the right, we now have a new <coughs> column which contains uh, our, our new data. Okay, so in this unit, I've shown you how to download data frames, how to uh, inspect them to make sure that the values all lie within a reasonable range, how to add and remove columns. And so I think the food is ready. Um, so there are some exercises associated with this lesson. So maybe go and get some coffee and some food, and then we can do the exercises when you get back. So if everybody can browse to the uh, unit one exercises, uh, I guess we've got three or four minutes for you all to have a go, uh, and after that I'll go through some answers. Okay, I think that was about five minutes. Um, does everybody feel like they've had enough time to give them a bit of a go? Okay, that was a yes. Um, okay, so this first one, you are tasked with uh, loading this Elastic Tensor 2015 data set and uh, inspecting it to get the total number of entries and the largest value of bulk modulus. Um, so we've kind of given you a helping hand here to get started. Um, all you need to do to load it is just put the database name into the load dataset function. So that's downloading it for me now. What about getting the number of entries? Well, we have a big hint here as well, which is we can use the describe function. So if we run this, this kind of solves both of these challenges for us. It tells us the number of entries. So this is um, 1181. And it also tells us the largest value of bulk modulus. So this is given in the KVRH column. So if we look at KVRH and then come down here, this last uh, row is the largest, uh, is the max value in the data set. That's nice and easy. What about uh, the second challenge here, which is filtering the data set to get um, based on the number of sites. So the aim is to filter to get all the entries where the number of sites is less than 20. So we can do this just using those masks, which I introduced in the notes. So here our mask is uh, the number of sites column is less than 20. And then to actually get those entries, um, we can do, we can index the data frame using that mask. And then again, we could get the number of entries in here using describe, or we can actually use just this typical Python len function, uh, which gets us the length of that data set. So this kind of is a quicker way of getting it. So if we do this, um, this says there's a 975 entries with number of sites less than 20. And actually, if we now call this describe function, we can see this data <coughs> We can also use this to get the average number of sites 
uh, in the filtered database. So this is um, mean here for n sites is 8.55. Okay, and lastly, I'll just do exercise three. This is removing columns uh, which are not required for machine learning. So we can do this using the drop function. Um, so we can see which columns we have in here. So we only want to keep the formula structure and KVRH columns. So let's see which columns we have, just using the columns attribute. Um, and so then we can actually copy all of these because we only want to keep three. And then we can remove them using drop. We put in our list of columns, which ones we want to keep. We want to keep formula structure, um, structure and KVRH. And the last thing, which is just really important when we're removing columns, is we have to tell the drop function whether we're removing rows or columns. Um, and so if we're removing columns, that just means we have to set axis equals one. <coughs> so if we do this, then we get our nice cleaned data set. So do we have any questions for unit one exercises? Okay, I think if we go ahead and we can open unit two notes now. <coughs> so, so far we've downloaded a data set <coughs> and we've cleaned it and removed all the unnecessary columns. Uh, we've checked that all the data lies within the reasonable range. The next thing we need to do is make it so that we can actually do machine learning on it. And so this is going back to what I talked about in that introduction about turning the kind of abstract formula or structure objects into actual descriptors that we can use for machine learning. And so we call this some jargon for you. We call this process featureization. Uh, and in MapMiner, we implement classes to do this. And these classes are called featureizers. Uh, and so we have a whole host of different featureizers, about 60. Uh, so some of these are um, things that we've come up with ourselves. Some of these are based on methods which have been published in the literature. And um, we can featureize a whole host of different objects. So we have uh, featureizers for structures, compositions, and band structures and density of states. The fundamental goal is that these featureizers take a, an object, like a, a composition, and they output just a vector of numbers. Um, we can feed these numbers into the machine learning algorithm. So here in this example, we're turning iron oxide into this, just this list of numbers here. Can you, can you just, just give an example on why these are sufficient to represent this? Uh, so th that's a good question. So basically, how to represent your data is a really open-ended question. And there's not, basically there's no, there's no one way which works best for every problem. So actually, generally what you end up doing is you featureize your data in as many ways as you can, or in many different ways, and then you choose the representations which work best for your problem. So, for example, let's say we have a structure. We might, if we're trying to predict some kind of physical property, then we might be interested in um, the average size of the ions in our uh, structure. If we're trying to predict some electronic property, we might be interested in the average orbital energies of the atoms in our, in our structure. And so what we end up doing is we usually choose the features which we think will best help us solve the problem that we're trying to learn. Um, and so, yeah, there's a whole host of featureizers out there. Which one you use is really due down to trial and error. Um, you try out a few and see which one works best. And you also have to use some chemical intuition as well. Okay, so what's nice about featureizers is that they interface really nicely with pandas data frames. So they return pandas data frames and they accept pandas data frames. Uh, and so uh, we can kind of iterate over these data frames very quickly. They also in, like, have some very uh, kind of nice support for things like, um, for things like parallelization. So you can actually generate features over multiple computer process, uh, computer CPUs uh, simultaneously. And they also have things for kind of handling errors that arise when you try and featureize objects which might not be amenable to featureization. Uh, and so we're not going to go into all of this in this lesson, but again, uh, I've 
There's a link here to the MapMiner website where there's, these are explained in a lot more details. Okay, so let's actually featureize something. So the, all the featureizers in MapMiner implement this featureize function. So let's try it out on something. Here we have, um, if we run this cell, this is just uh, generating a composition for iron oxide. Um, so all these featureizers work with typical PyMatch uh, objects. So let's make a featureizer. So here we're going to use the element fraction featureizer, and that you can see here that this is a compositional featureizer because it's in the composition module. So if we make it, and we just call it uh, EF, and we can just initialize it just uh, with empty arguments like that. And now we can use this to featureize our composition. So if we call ef.featureize, and we feed in our composition, we get this vector of numbers come out. So this isn't particularly understandable. Um, what do these numbers mean? Well, first of all, let's just assign this to our, um, just assign this to EF features. Okay, we can see what all these features correspond to by using the feature labels function of the featureizer. So if we type ef.featurelabels, you can see that these correspond to the fraction of certain elements in our composition. So then we can check that this featureizer has worked well. So if we assign this to EF feature labels, we can then try and match up our features with our feature labels. So let's just print the uh, feature at the index seven, and also simultaneously, oh sorry, there should be features here, and simultaneously print the feature label for feature seven. So here you can see it's printed out 0.6 and oxygen. So if we look at our composition again, our composition is Fe203, um, oxygen is three fifths of our composition, and then that's why we have 0.6 as our feature. If we look at um, the index of number 25, so I'll just copy and paste this onto a new line. This is, so iron is number 26 in the periodic table. Uh, therefore, we have a, fe a feature of 0.4. And so all the other features in this feature vector are going to be zero because there are none of those elements in the composition. So this is how you featureize a single composition, but actually generally what we'll have is a whole data frame full of compositions. And so featureizing each one in this process is going to take a long time. So we've kind of made it a lot easier to do, to featureize a whole data frame uh, by implementing this featureize data frame method. So let's load a data set with some compositions in it. So this is a, a database of super hard materials. It's going to download. And then we're going to print out just the first few rows and columns. And if we come across here, you can see that we have a composition column. And this composition column just is uh, a whole series of pi match n compositions. So we can featureize this entire column using this featureize data frame method. So all we do is we type here, which is our featureizer, dot featureize data frame. And then the first argument for this is the data frame that we want to featureize, and the second argument is the column which we're going to featureize. And because this is a compositional featureizer, we need to give it the compositions. So we put composition here. And this composition here corresponds directly to this column, this column name here. And if we run this, we get a fancy loading bar, and then we print out our new data frame, and if we scroll all the way across, you can see here we've had our new feature vectors added to the data frame. And these have all been given an individual column, and you can see what the feature is itself, just it's been given a title here. So we can, so that was an example of uh, compositional features. I mentioned before that we can featureize all sorts of objects in MapMiner, 
Let's show you some structure features now. So let's load a data set with structures in it. Uh, so this is a database of dielectric constants from the materials project. Again, this is going to download. And you can see that we have this structure column here, and this contains a whole list of structures. OK, so a kind of very common and cheap and easy to use featureizer, which gives you information about the density of a structure, is kind of implemented in this density features featureizer. So again, all featureizers have the same um, interface. So we create it just in the same way that we created our element featureizer by doing, um, sorry, by doing, uh, let's call this density equals density features. And then we can featureize our data frame uh, in exactly the same way. So let's type, uh, so we want density, and we use the featureize data frame function. And again, our first argument is the data frame that we want to featureize, and the second argument is the column. And so here, our structures are in the structure column, so we just put structure in here. And if we run this, this takes slightly longer, but again, we see a new data frame, and if we scroll all the way across, again, we now have three new features added. This is, we've added density, uh, the volume per atom, and the packing fraction. Okay, so there's one more class of featureizers that I want to introduce quickly, and these are a kind of special class. So typically when you get a data set, it might not already have PyMatGen objects in it. It might just have formulas, for example. Um, and these featureizers that we use need composition objects in order to be able to actually generate the features. So a whole portion of MapMiner is dedicated to conversion featureizers. So these that take a column, for example, of formulas, or a column of postcards, or anything, and convert it into the corresponding PyMatGen object. And so perhaps the most common one is this string to composition. So this is effectively converting a formula into an actual composition object. Uh, and I'll just show you how to use that quickly. These conversion featureizers, again, have exactly the same interface which um, the or the structural and composition feature writers have. So we just create it um, like that. And if we featureize our formula column, so if, um, let me just show you the, this data frame that we have here. We have a formula here. Uh, this is formulas now, no composition. We can featureize that. We can turn that column into compositions by just running stc.featureize data frame. Again, simple data frame and then the column formula. And this will just go through and just convert all those objects from formulas into compositions. Okay, so these, this is kind of like a piece of glue which makes MapMiner very useful for different um, problems. Because really when you get a data set, often it's not very homogenous. You have loads of different data types in. And so you need to be able to get it into a standard format quite quickly. And this makes it very easy to do. So that's a kind of brief run through of some of the, uh, some of the featureizers that we have in MapMiner. There are many more, about 60. Um, there's also many other kind of properties of them, which I won't go into here. One last thing which I'll mention is that uh, in machine learning, we think it's really important that you, if you're using a method, you cite where that method came from or where that idea was proposed. And so many of the featureizers that we've Im implemented in MapMiner actually came from, um, came from published papers. And so, if you, uh, so basically most of these featureizers also implement a citations function. So if you call that, it will print out the relevant citation for that featureizer. Okay, so that was um, a really quick run through on how to featureize PyMetGen objects and turn them into machine learnable vectors. We now have an exercise where you have a go at featureizing some things yourself. So I'd say we've got about five minutes for you guys to have a go at that. And if anybody's got any questions, you can take those as well. Okay, I think in the interest of time, we'll continue. So uh, let's first of all just load our data frame. 
So you can see it has a structure column, it has a formula column, an order composition column, and our target property, which is the bulk modulus. So the first exercise is to convert the formula column into a compositions, and we can do this using the structure to composition featureizer. And so again, the interface for all of these featureizers is always the same. The first argument is data frame, and then the second argument is the column that you want to featureize. So in this case, we want to featureize the formula column. And that's done. And then the next exercise is to convert the uh, compositions that we've just generated into uh, element fraction features. And so we can do that again using the same um, interface, first argument <coughs> data frame, second argument, this time we're going to put in our composition column. And lastly, uh, we're going to add some structure featureizers, and again, we do this in the same way. First argument, data frame, last argument, structure. Okay, that's it. It's very straightforward. Okay, now on to the last unit. This is in unit three notes. That's a very good question, yeah. So the string representation of the composition object doesn't tell you the number or like the actual fraction of those elements in the composition. Okay. It just tells you just the raw but elements. It's but it's in there, yeah. It's just that specific representation of it doesn't have the, the numbers of elements. Yeah. Okay, so we've downloaded our data set, we've cleaned it, we've added machine learning features. How about actually doing some machine learning on it? So, in Python, there are two main packages which are used to do machine learning. The first is scikit-learn, which I'll talk about today, which implements conventional machine learning algorithms, and then the second, or two packages really, are Keras and TensorFlow, which are for doing deep neural networks. Um, that could be a whole workshop in itself, so I'm not going to get into that. But briefly about scikit-learn, uh, it's an open source package, and it integrates very nicely with MapMiner. So all of MapMiner output is designed to be fed directly into the machine learning algorithms implemented in scikit-learn. And so in scikit-learn you have a whole host of different machine learning algorithms. Simple things like linear regression to more complicated algorithms like um, some decision tree uh, models like random forests, which we're going to be using today. So first of all, we're just going to load a data set which I made earlier. It has been cleaned and featureized using the featureizers which I introduced before. So the first part of any machine learning study before we feed it into our, our algorithm is to separate the data set into our target property and the features which we're going to be using for training. And so we can do this just using pandas, using the um, functions which I introduced in the first lesson. So in this data set, this is a data set of elastic constants. The elastic constant itself is stored in the uh, KVRH column. Uh, you can see that there's some other columns in here as well, like structure, formula, and composition. And then after these columns, you have all the features. Um, and so there's many kind of compositional features and also the density features, which I introduced earlier. So the first thing we need to do is um, get out our target property. And generally, we, call, we put our target property into a variable called Y. And so all we can do here is just index the data frame for the KVRH column. And what we're going to do is we're going to um, use the values attribute, and this just returns an actual NumPy array or a list effectively, rather than the actual pandas data frame object. And so if we print our Y, this is just a list of the, of the uh, target bulk modulus. Okay, the second thing we need to do is get out just a, uh, our features themselves. And so we're going to do a similar thing. Uh, what we need to do is drop all the columns which are not machine learning features. Uh, sorry, we need to drop all, the, yeah, drop all the columns which are not machine learning features. And in general, we put our machine learning features into a variable named capital X. And so again, we can, just using this, we can do this using the data frame, data frame drop function. 
So we're going to put in here structure, formula, composition. And the last thing which is really important is that we don't include, we also need to drop our target property from the data frame as well. Because if we included our target property in the list of features, that would make the job of the machine learning algorithm very, very easy to do. So we add that in here. And lastly, uh, we just add this axe equals one option to set, specify that we're dropping columns. And so we can, once we've done that, we can see a list of all the features that are included in our model by accessing the column attribute of this data frame. Oops, columns, sorry. And so, yep, these are just what I showed you before, things like these MagPy features, which you can read about online, and then these density features here. Okay, so now we've separated our model into the machine learning target property and the machine learning vec um, features, we can now actually do some machine learning. So, as I said before, scikit-learn implements a whole bunch of different machine learning models. Oh, sorry, everybody got that. Um, yeah, it implements a whole bunch of machine learning models. It's really impossible to know in advance which machine learning model will be best for your particular application. So what you generally have to do is trial out a whole bunch of different models and see which one works best. So in this exercise, we're going to use, we're just going to start with a random forest model. And this is generally a very good starting model because it generally performs quite well. I'm not going to go into too much detail about, about the underlying, how this actually works, but uh, it's based on decision trees and it's an ensemble of, of decision trees. Um, but let's make a random forest model here. So we're going to make a variable called RF and it's a, we're going to initialize this random forest regressor. And we're going to initialize it with two variables. The first is n estimators. And so this is the number of actual decision trees which the model uses. And we're going to set this to 100. And so this n estimators is an example of what's called a hyperparameter. And so hyperparameters are parameters that control the performance of your model. And again, these are variables which you can't know in advance which are going to be uh, best for your particular application. Yeah. How do we know which number do you put? Yeah, so you, the problem is that you don't. Uh, and there's no way of being able to tell. So there's a whole kind of subfield of machine learning which is actually called machine learning optimi uh, hyperparameter optimization. And so generally 100 is a good starting point. But in order to find the best model, the, the best hyperparameters, genuinely the, one of the best ways of doing this is just trial and error. Try random numbers. Uh, and try random numbers from a search base. And um, yeah, that mm -hmm. seems to be like one of the best ways of doing it. Is it fast enough that you can try a really lot of numbers? Well, this is the thing. So there are some uh, approaches where you basically have, you enumerate through all possible um, hyperparameters that could be. Because also this is just one hyperparameter. These models generally have many hyperparameters. So there's something called a grid search, which is where you go through, enumerate through every single possible combination. But the parameter space is so large that you can't really do this. So instead, what you, this is why random uh, kind of tuning is often used. There's uh, another thing which is, so people have developed uh, genetic algorithms, which can actually, you can use those to optimize your hyperparameters that way. So there's a, a library which we use quite often called Teapot, which is actually a hyperparameter optimization library. And that also doesn't just optimize your hyperparameters, it also optimizes your machine learning model as well. So we'll try a whole bunch of model space, basically. So this is, that's an estimators. Uh, the other thing which I want you guys to add is this option called, uh, what's it called? Uh, random state. Okay, so this is just, uh, so basically the way these decision trees work is there's an inherent bit of randomness in them. <coughs> if we all add this random state equals one, it means that we'll all get the same model performance at the end. Okay, so let's make our model. So that's done. All scikit-learn models implement two functions. One which is fit, which trains the model, and another one which is predict, which, um, you've, which kind of gives you a prediction. And so let's train our model. So we can just do rf.fit. The first argument is our feature vectors, which is going to use to learn. And the second argument is our target property. So this is what it's gonna, it's gonna learn against. And if we do this, it might take a second especially if everybody does it at the same time. But yeah, there we go. That's trained. Uh, you've all just trained a machine learning model. So that's all well and good, but how well does our model actually perform? 
OK, so in order to do this, we need to ask our model to predict um, against some input. So the simplest way of doing this is we ask it to just predict against our original input. So to do this, let's make a variable called y pred, which y predict, and we're going to run rf.predict, and we're just going to give it our original input. So if we run this, this should be very quick. Now y pred contains an array of predictions for all rows in our original data set. And so we can evaluate the performance of, of our predictions using a number of metrics. Uh, so scikit-learn implements a whole bunch of them in this metrics module. In this example, we're going to be using root mean squared error. So basically, this is just the, the error between each pairwise prediction and actual target property. And we're just going to, so we use the mean squared error function, and we take the square root at the end to get the root mean squared error. So I've just kind of made a cell here which you can run, and it will just print out our training error there. So you shouldn't have to edit anything in this. And so you can see we have a training root mean squared error of 7.2 gigapascals. And if, you, uh, if we go to the top and have a quick look at our data frame, you can see that our kind of bulk modulus are all, sometimes on the order of about 300. So a kind of error of three oh, of seven is actually very reasonable. There's something to note, though, which is that we've trained our data, we've trained our model on all of our data and then asked it to predict against exactly the same data. So this really is not how you should be evaluating this model. Instead, what you have to do is something called cross-validation. And so in this process, what you have to do is you have to evaluate your model on data which is unseen. The aim of a machine learning model is to predict uh, new, uh, predict the properties of materials it's never seen before. So what we do is we split our model into two parts, uh, our data into two parts. There's a training set which we use to train the model, and there's a completely separate set called a testing set on which we evaluate the model. The model should never see any of the samples in the evaluation set before, it's, um, before it tries to predict on them. So generally what we do is we split our model into, say, 90% training, 10% uh, testing. But how we split the model, it turns out, this can, how we split the data, sorry, can actually affect our overall performance. So for example, if we split um, the model in one particular way, uh, it might give a higher performance than if we split it on a different random half of the data. And so instead what we do is we do this thing called cross-validation, where we split the data into n samples, so let's say 10 samples, we, oh, sorry, not, when I say samples, we split the data into 10 splits. So 10 chunks of data. Each of these chunks contains equ uh, approximately equal number of samples. We then train the data, uh, train the model on n minus 1 splits. So uh, 9 chunks, let's say. And then we evaluate the model on the final remaining chunk. And then what we do is we iterate this 10 times. So at some point, each of the splits is used as the testing data set. And then we take the overall average at the end to get the true predictive performance of our model. And so that entire process is called cross-validation. It's incredibly important that you evaluate your models in this way. And so we can split our data into these uh, kind of 10 test train splits using this k-fold object here. So let's create a new k-fold object. We're going to just call it k-fold. And this accepts two arguments. Uh, the first one is n splits. So this is uh, how many chunks of data we have. And the second is uh, we're going to also use the same random state. This is because uh, the way kfold works, it uh, splits it randomly into these samples. But in order for you guys to get exactly the same result as me, we'll do this random state again. And if we create this, we can then actually use this kfold uh, cross-validation scheme to actually evaluate our model. So here I'm using a function provided by scikit-learn called crossval score. And this accepts the model that we're using, our features, and the target property, as well as a kind of some scoring metric and our k-fold, which is just our way of splitting the data up. And it does the process which I just described. It splits the data, it trains the model on the testing set, evaluates it on the training, oh, sorry, it trains the model on the training set, it evaluates it on the testing set, and does that for all the splits of the data, and eventually gives you all the scores back at the end. And so we can, if we run this, uh, this is going to take 
I think about a minute or slightly longer for, if everyone runs it at the same time. It takes a bit of time because we have to t train 10 different models. Um, but eventually, this should give us a final score. The final score is, oh, you said it's going to be average. So the final score is the average root mean squared error for each of the... So basically, each entry in your data set will have some point been used in the testing data set. It's the average error of all the samples when they were in the training, when they were in the testing data set. Okay. And so, yep, so it's here, we can see that our root mean squared error has gone all the way up to, so it's tripled to about 18. So obviously this is a lot higher, but it's still pretty reasonable. I think the thing to take away from this is that uh, this is kind of makes sense because we really would expect that our uh, error goes up when we, because uh, we're now actually evaluating the predictive performance of our model uh, overall. Okay, so I'm just going to sh show you guys really quickly about how we can investigate and see and try and interpret how our model's performing. So there's a similar function in scikit-learn to the cross-val score, which is called cross-val predict. So this works in a very similar way. It splits your data up into the different chunks, but rather than returning the final score, it actually returns the predictions. Um, so the prediction of a sample when it was in the testing set. So let's, um, let's try this. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make a variable called ypred, and we're going to run it using this crossval predict function. This works in a similar way. We give it our, uh, our model, our random forest. We give it our input data. We give it our target property. And lastly, we give it uh, the k-fold scheme, which we're using to, oops, sorry, this should be k-fold, which is going to split our data up for us. And so if we run this, this again will probably take about the same amount of time as the scoring method did, because again, we have to train 10 different models. Yeah. So since we're training 10 different models, ultimately which one is the model we need to choose? The one with the lowest? So this is to evaluate the perform like how your model will predict for unseen samples. Let's say you were then going to actually put your model into production and start predicting new materials. At that point, then you train on all of your data. So you use the model trained on all of your data pr to predict new materials. But when you're trying to evaluate how good it will be at actually evaluating new materials, you have to train it on a limited portion of the data. OK, so that's done. And so finally, there's a cell here, which if we run, hopefully will plot the predicted performance versus the actual performance. So you can really quickly see here that, uh, in general, most of the data is following this uh, trend line here, which is exactly um, predicted equals actual. And you can really quickly see some outliers. So if you hover over them, you can see here we've got an outlier, which I think is diamond, if I remember correctly. Yeah. So, so okay, I should say that. So this predicted values here, these are the predicted of the testing samples. So these are the predictions when the samples were in the testing set. Where did you write the predictions? So this is all handled automatically by this cross file predict method. So this will do exactly that. It will split the data up. It will train it on 90% of the data. It will predict on 10% of the data and return the predictions for that 10%. Um, it will then go over all the samples in turn so that at some point they are in the training set. Oh, sorry, the testing set. This will always take 90 uh, No, so this is, sorry, I should have mentioned that actually. So back when we defined our k fold CV, here, this n splits, we've split it into 10. That means that uh, each case, one of these sets will be used for. So basically, there's 10 different chunks. When we actually put that into uh, the predict method, it will use nine of them for training and then one of them for testing. If we put this as five, for example, then now we have five chunks. Uh, when we run our cross file predict, now 80% of the data will be used for training and 20% will be used for um, testing. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, can I say something on the effect of this random state? Yeah. Oh, can I say something? Oh, okay. So basically, I thought, I thought you were saying, could you say something? I was like, go ahead. Um, 
So yeah, the random state is just simply there's um, so the way they choose the samples is they try it tries to be so the way it chooses to split the samples into the different splits it tries to be non-deterministic so it tries to be random um, so that if you run the k-fold a number of different times it will each time give you 10 different ways of splitting up your data uh, this this random state actually controls how random that is so basically uh, if we all use the same random state then we all get the same split at the end so we all get the same 10 different uh, data splits so if you So no, so random state is not. So it doesn't include how increase how random it is. It's just like a. It's like a seed. Like seed, exactly. Yeah, it's the seed for how then it actually splits them up. Yeah. yeah. Is that random state has a um, default value? I think it's none. I think it's a default value. We can just have a quick look. Um, so I think it's none. There you go. Um, okay, so there's a little bit more about how to interpret our models. Maybe I'll just run through this in one minute because it's kind of interesting. So generally, when you train a machine learning model, you are interested in why it's performing in the certain way it is. Like, why is it giving you those specific predictions? And uh, this is a, generally a, quite a big field in machine learning as well. Like, how do we actually understand how our model's performing? The really nice thing about random forest models is that they are very transparent to what they're doing. So they have uh, this attribute called feature importances. And this is basically how important a feature was in actually determining the final predicted value. And so this is just a list of numbers for each of the features. What we can do is we can actually plot all of these. So if we run this final cell, this will plot the importances for our model that we trained. And it's crashed my computer. Maybe, <laughs> maybe. Hopefully, all of you guys are seeing some lovely, yeah. lovely bar graphs now. But yeah, so some of you might be seeing some bar graphs where it shows which features are important. And if I remember properly, uh, I think it was the mean melting temperature of all your atoms and the volume per atom are the two most important features for this, um, for this model. Yeah. So sorry, we only plot the five most important features here. Yeah. Okay. So I think I've gone a little bit over time. There are some exercises associated with this as well, where you can try and train your own machine learning model. Um, oh yeah. Sorry. So so when we see this feature importance ranking uh, afterwards, uh, if we want to train our a bigger data set, uh, does that mean we could just chop off some of the features that? Are not being uh, very useful. Yeah, I mean that's so basically. This is another field of machine learning: is how to actually, you, if you generate a whole load of features, how do you reduce these down to just a small number of features? And yeah, a very common way is to use these tree-based methods to keep training models until, and then kind of cutting off with only like the, maybe the, the top ten percent important features until you reduce the number of features in your overall data set to like a manageable size, maybe five or ten. Yeah. So yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. Would you recommend feature scaling for the second one? Yeah, so I would generally recommend normalizing your features to be within like zero and one or some kind of normalization method. If you use this package which I was uh, talking about before, Teapot, uh, for kind of optimizing your models, this actually can do all of that for you as well. And the other thing I would add as like a bit of self-promotion, we are also working on a package which can, uh, you give it a data set and it's effectively a black box model. You give it a data set and it gives you a trained machine learning algorithm at the end. Uh, and maybe this will be demonstrated in next year's workshop. But this is called Automap Miner. Uh, so I encourage you, if you're interested, check it out. Come back. Sure. Uh, I'm wondering where this magpie data Sure, so that's a very good question as well. So the, at the start of this exercise, I made you guys load uh, pre-cleaned and featureized data. Uh, the Magpie features were um, developed by a group at uh, Alex Dunn. Where are they based? Northwestern. Northwestern. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, Northwestern. And so basically, this is their own custom uh, ideas of what good composition features are. So I can't remember what all of them mean, but basically, it's just a preset of compositional features which have generally proved very useful for machine learning. 
Yeah, 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 sure. Um, yeah, there's a magpie feature. It's not called magpie featureizer. It's called element property. And we have different presets for that. And there's a magpie preset. But again, if you go onto the MyMyAnya examples repository, there's uh, examples on how to use these magpie features and how to generate them. Okay. Oh, yeah. So I remember that we uh, dropped some of the columns on the category. Um, has anyone tried doing uh, machine learning problems using encoding for those things? Yeah. How so, are those so I'm not sure how. I don't think one hot encoding of formulas are going to work very well. Um, I don't know any other example. So we, in this automat minor package that we've developed, we do automatic encoding of, one hot encoding of um, kind of string based features. I generally think these often turn out to be not very important, um, especially for our problems. But yeah, that's all. Okay, if there's no more questions, I guess, I don't know if Donnie or anybody else has anything they'd like to add at the end of the workshop. But I hope you've all had a great time, and it was definitely good having you guys here. So, yeah. Yeah.